Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you today, Joelle? Jason, I have been thinking about my childhood. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> This, this, um, it's not that kind of podcast. I don't want see, to. See, <laughs> this, this dark humor thing has got me sort of thinking about, you know, when when did it start? Um, and this is not not actually related to my dark humor, but um, I think that it's possibly a bit of an origin story about why. Yeah, why, I like origin why stories. Why Joelle yeah. became a yeah. psychologist um, and not in the, in the trauma way. Um, so when I was a child, I was scared of moths. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what what it was about moths, but I've just like, if I would be in the toilet and if there was a moth in there with me, I would like scream the roof down and my little brother who's four years younger than me would come running in to rescue me from, from this terrible moth. Um, and I got to a point, I would have been maybe eight or nine years old and I realised that it was just, you know, it's a bit absurd um, to be afraid of moths. They can't hurt me. That's just dumb. Come on. Um, and I have this really vivid memory of being in my school classroom and there were these um, fairly large moths that sort of would collect along the windowsill of the classroom. And I walked over and just picked up a moth and let it crawl over my hand. And like the hairs on my arms were standing on end and I was having like shivers running down my spine, but I just gritted my teeth and made myself stand there with this moth crawling on me until it was okay. So you were doing your own flooding on yourself. I was as an eight year old with no, you know, I didn't have any psychology training at that stage, shockingly as an eight year old, but um, something in my brain went, yep, this is, this is the way to do this. So um, although at that time I didn't want to be a psychologist, that's where I've ended up. So um, yeah, there you go. My origin story. Okay. So that's how you des- desired to become a psychologist or no, help people that, overcome their fears or no, I was more selfish than that. Yeah. That was just about me. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually decide that I wanted to be a psychologist until I was about 15. You probably didn't know what a psychologist was when you were eight. To no, be fair. probably not. Mm. No, I think I wanted to be a vet then. Yeah. Or maybe a nurse. Cause my mum was a nurse. Yeah. Funny. You didn't like moths though. And you yeah. wanted to work with animals. Well, do vets look after moths though? Probably not. No. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, um, we're, we're learning more and more about you. I mean, mm. you've been at People Diagnostics now for a couple of months mm. and um, uh, we're learning a lot of great things, a lot of not so great things uh, along the <laughs> it's way. All, it's all part of the mix. It's all part of the magic. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, what I'd like to do is introduce our guest for today. He doesn't want to hear us like, you know, uh, banter on. Um, he's one of only a few chartered psychologists who are also chartered fellows of IOSH. He's considered a world authority on the subject of behavioral safety, safety leadership, and organizational culture with several books authored on the subject. He hails from Manchester, England. Welcome to the podcast, Professor Tim Marsh. Uh, I, I, I'm in Manchester, England, but, um, I hail from old South Wales. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> he current, currently is in Manchester, England. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. great, great to have you on the show. Um, one of our um, uh, avid listeners, uh, Vince Butler, um, suggested to get you on the show. And um, yeah, after Joelle had a chat with you, she agreed. So <laughs> it's really great to have you on. Uh, uh, thank you. All right. Um, now, you, you confessed to me that you don't like to listen to podcasts, which is, is devastating for us as uh, podcasters. Um, but uh, we decided to talk to you anyway. Um, so instead of asking you about what you're listening to, what are you reading? Um, I've, I've been reading um, uh, a lot of stuff on uh, Kenevin thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a Welsh link there. Uh, there was a, a thread on LinkedIn. An old friend of mine had a beach uh, set up saying, you know, what's the best analysis tool out there? You know, what's real deep thinking about why things happen? And uh, a lot of people said, oh, you've got to check out this Kenevin thing. Um it's sort of spelt Sinophen, but it's pronounced Kenevin. Um, and it turns out that it's hugely influential. In fact, it's the most used word in the Welsh language because of its international influence in places like the White House and so on. So I, I, I've been looking up on, on that and, and reading up on that. That's been, been quite interesting. So, 
Yeah. Cool. That's, I have that's, that's my book, book of the week. <laughs> floating around quite a bit. Yeah, I don't read a lot. So. No, Jason's not a yeah. – no, he, he's not that kind of person. <laughs> no. We've already established <clears> that. Podcasts, Joel, I'm, old, but I'm, I'm, I'm old and uh, I still do books, uh, yeah. really. So <laughs> I, I haven't caught up with the modern world yet, you know. Yeah. That's a, I think books are cool. I like books. I, I only got my first smartphone early, early, uh, earlier this year, actually. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, well, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any words. <laughs> Articulate. Yeah, yeah, that's Joel. Yeah, it's been pointed out to us today from um, someone else out your way uh, that J- Joel is the brains of the operation. Okay. Yeah. So, they're so they're so distracting smartphones. They do so many different things. It's difficult to put them down and leave them alone, isn't it? So. Yeah. Now I, I really wish I just had my Nokia with snake on it um, from back in the day. So that was probably enough. I, don't I, think I had that until that. a couple of months ago. I had a Nokia with snake on it. <laughs> it only it only did two things which was fantastic <laughs> yeah. you had to press the button so many times to send a text oh god oh yeah people used to get crazy you know it really annoyed with me they'd send me these lovely long texts and they did take them into the phones and i go yes <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we could probably just nonsense on for hours, but um, we our listeners might get a bit frustrated with us, so yeah, uh, we didn't... should we should probably proceed. Yeah. Um, tell us about your professional career. Well, the, the, the whole of it. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, okay. My, my my professional career as a psychologist. Uh, uh, I did all sorts until I was in my late twenties. Then did a, a, a did a degree in my early twenties. Then did all sorts again. Then a master's and a PhD in in psychology, occupational psychology. My first job was to look at why recruits uh, kill themselves um, in the UK Army, uh, and and the the answer turned out to be that. I, I, am I on uh, screen, by the way? Because I noticed that the sun has just come straight through the window. And am I just talking? No, oh, you're on screen. Yeah. yeah. That should help a bit. Um, so uh, the, the answer was really simple. They, they would take anybody at all that would stand up and they would put them in, in barracks for basic training. And if you enjoyed it, you really thrived. I mean, you know, if you like being in the army, you love being in the army. If you don't, it's a nightmare. Um, and so that, that, that's why some, some lads were able to say, I've had enough of this, I'm off. Others couldn't bring themselves to say that. So they kind of imploded. Um, that was that was my first real job as a as a, as a doctor of psychology, and um, because I'd worked with the army, when we had a huge construction related behavioural safety research project here in the UK, it went on for five years. Dom Cooper was the other lead psychologist on that, if you if you know the name. Um, they, they said, well, if you can work with squaddies, you can probably work on building sites, um, because you're know, sending a psychologist to a building site was considered quite high risk. Really. <laughs> so <laughs> and. Uh, so, so uh, I did that and loved it, absolutely loved it. And then from uh, writing up reports about behavioural safety on construction sites led, of course, to things like a lot of behavioural safety on, on oil rigs and so on. Okay. Um, and so, so that's, that, that's you know, launched as, a, as, a, as somebody with a company making money. Um, but, you know, what you find with behavioural safety, of course, is that if you, once you look at why people are behaving unsafely, it's all about the leadership. So very quickly, you're working in the world of safety leadership. And when you really look at safety leadership, you realize it's all about culture. Mm. So you're working in the world of organizational culture uh, as as a safety culture. And of course, once you do safety culture, you realize it's just a subset of culture culture. So you end up doing something quite holistic and integrated, um, which is is where we are now, uh, because safety is just a subset of human error. So, you know, and, and... at taking a holistic and integrated approach to to human error is is where we are now. That's that, that's it. Yeah, no, no, that was uh, <laughs> that was that was really the cliff notes. Yeah, no, um, I know. Yeah, you're um, uh, very well read. You've authored an, a number of books. Um, actually, given your history in behavioural safety, um, what motivated you to write one of your books called "A Definitive Guide to Behavioural Safety"? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there's a big, big controversy about behavioral safety, of course, especially if you're coming at it from the safety differently field, which you know, obviously started in uh, the other side of the country for you guys, Brisbane, isn't it? I think. Mm. Um, and, and there's, you know, anybody who, who works under the banner behavioral safety must be a behaviorist. So it's all about dogs salivating and, and pigeons pecking and so on. And of course, that's, that's not the case at all. If you 
if you if you're coming into behavioral safety having read james reason and having read sydney decker you know so it's all about you know uh hindsight and uh you know taking away the, the hindsight and and looking at genuine root causes just culture and so on you know what what you're doing is you, you're understanding that 90 percent of why behaviors occur um is because of the organizational structures because you know we're set up to deliver exactly what's happening so if you want to change what's happening you have to change the way that it's organized and resourced um and so good behavioral safety i think is all about behavioral root cause analysis teams so it's not saying to people, I've just caught you wearing your hard hat, catch a person doing something right, well done, do it again. You know, that's a small element of good behavioural safety. But the big element is there's a group of people over there, they're not wearing their hard hats. I'd better go and find out why. Mm. And it could be that they don't fit or they're not available or they don't perceive the risk or nobody else did. Or there's one guy who just sets the tone for the whole site and he never does. So nobody else does like the, the rugby captain, you know, and so on. Um, and, and so I think really good behavioural safety is based on behavioural root cause analysis teams, you know, where you say to, say to people from the workforce, you know, things are not right out there because they never are. Well, what's particularly bad and why is it happening and what can we do about it? So, so really good behavioural safety is based on analysis and empowerment. Um, so I thought I, I'd write a book with a provocative title um, saying, look, you know, uh, catching a person doing something right, catching a person doing something wrong, for that matter, is, is an element of it, but it's a small element. So um, uh, uh, I, I wrote the book with the title in the hope of provoking a debate. Yeah. And, and how has it been received? Uh, nobody, nobody criticised it at all, actually. Oh, so there goes the debate. <laughs> 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 So, uh, but but this, but then they wouldn't because the people who would automatically pile in and criticise it uh, are the safety differently yep. uh, advocates and so on. And of course, because it says root cause analysis, root cause analysis, Sydney Decker, James Reason, Sydney Decker. There's there's not an awful lot to criticise. You know, well, we're singing from the same hymn sheet, and 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 I, you know, I really couldn't agree more with with the principle that the workers are the solution, not the problem. That the question you ask them is, um, you know, I, I you want to be safe and productive. I want you to be safe and productive. What do you need for me to do that? I yeah. mean, we, we all agree on that. There's, there's, there's no controversy, really. Um, there's, there's, there's not many people out there still doing the whole catch a person doing something right, and that's all you need to do. Yeah. You know, that, and that tends to come from marketing these days and internal comms, you know, fancy posters. If you get yeah. the message right, they'll listen to it. So uh, there's, there's not many good safety prof professionals out there still doing the whole look at this poster and, and listen to Jason Anker talking, and, and that's got it covered. Yeah, no, I do. I was just saying to Joelle, actually, my memories of seeing BBS on mine sites was uh, a big sign saying, have you seen the gorilla? And it came from this whole, uh, do you remember that video where, um, you know, it showed the limitations of attention? Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that was part of this uh, behavioral based safety training program, uh, teaching people about, you know, um, th that in particular. Um, and then the poster was there to reinforce the message from the training. Um, but yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, you used, it, used it a million times, of course. Uh, got a big client actually once. Uh, I, I followed into a long time ago now, I followed into really kind of slick consultancies, you know, the big, big mm -hmm. names. I won't mention what they are, but yep. you'd recognize them. And they'd done the all singing, all dancing, flip charts, and this, and projections, and all, all the, the marketing stuff. And I thought, well, I can't compete with that, you know. So I just said, oh, I got this video, I'll show you. And if, you, if it works, you know. And uh, so I showed them the gorilla video, which is a, a shipbuilder in Glasgow, and they didn't spot the gorilla. Yeah. And uh, so I explained the psychology behind it and all the rest of it. And uh, that was it. We got the contract. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was... <laughs> uh... I, I, couldn't, I couldn't compete with the slick marketing stuff. But, uh, but you know, these, these days, uh, you know, we refer to the gorilla when we're talking about mental health, you know. So we say, yeah. you know, if you, yeah. you know, it's, it's, uh, attentional blindness and uh, look but not see and, and all that good psychology. But, but, you know, one of the things with, with the gorilla clip of these days, if you talk about somebody's having a really bad day because they're struggling with their mental health, you know, they don't, they don't see the basketball players either. Yeah. You know, yeah. whatever. I don't care. You know, I don't like basketball. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't fit oh, in. Okay. Enough, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that's a uh, yeah, good analogy, actually. Um, so have you, have you spoken with Sydney Decker at all? Um, in I, I, I have met him a couple of times. Uh, utterly charming, of course. Um, it's hugely intimidating intellectually, uh, as you know, and uh, it's, it's appalling how much energy he's got. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> no wonder he achieves so much. 
<laughs> yeah, we just met a, an academic like that yesterday, uh, Dr. Kirsten Way, uh, out of Brisbane as well, actually. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, amazing what they've got their head around at the moment, these yeah. people. So Yeah, just the sheer volume of stuff that she was working on as well is crazy. Yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, so what about, um, yeah, I guess you, you talked a little bit about sort of your um, actual OHS practitioners and, and the views that they have. Um We've heard from a few people talking about sort of radical behaviourism um, in relation to safety programs. Um, do you get much um, noise from those types of people? Radical behaviourism? What, what, what's radical behaviourism? Well, I think it is sort of that Skinner. Um, oh, the, the, good, the good old-fashioned, yeah. you know, oh, the, oh, yeah, the obs- oh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I know it as something that's entirely based on observation and feedback, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, 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 you know, I, um, I got no problem with people doing that. We, you know, the best selling management book of all time is the one minute manager, catch a person doing something right and praise them. Um, you know, uh, Skinner, uh, Powell of their household names for, 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 for a good reason. But, you know, if you, if you're looking at a workforce, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, those techniques are best used with your children, I think, when you're trying to persuade them to wash up after a meal. And, you know, if you're looking at a workforce full of adults uh, doing a job, uh, 90% of what's going on there is cultural and structural. So, so you know, by definition, 10% of what you're, you could spend your resource and, and time doing needs to be behavioural, you know, and 90% needs to be analytical. Um, so... You know, uh, if 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 you, sometimes I'm obviously I'm, I'm invited in to to critique an existing program, um, and and obviously the, the first thing you say about anything that's entirely based on observation is well, where's where's all the analysis? Where's your five whys? If, if nothing else, uh, and and so on. So so no, I I don't um, I I don't get any flack from the behaviorists. I don't even know of any. Like I can't even think of any still in existence. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess there are like small consultants knocking around in different outposts who've picked up on that maybe and are still flogging it at, at, at a cheap rate to local companies, uh, SMEs we call them, small medium companies. I, I I I haven't come up against anybody. Coaching is 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 the interesting one, where you've got people in, embedded coaches on site. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you kind of clash against them and say, well, how much of that coaching is analysis based and how much of it is person based? But no, I don't, yeah. I, I, don't yeah. I, 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 I genuinely, uh, I, I, I can't remember the last time I was criticized for any, any of my behavioral work. So. Yeah. Uh, interesting that you say that these days we know that, you know, about 90% of uh, human behavior is explained by, you know, the culture and the environment and the systemic causes um, because I'd say probably the opposite view is held with workplace mental health. You know, 90% is due to individuals and their own behaviours, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, there, there is. No, here is a, an, an area of, of current controversy. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of people say that uh, anybody from the uh, occupational safety world shouldn't be anywhere near uh, mental health, um, that it's 90% from homes you know for your genes yes my phd is in this actually so i, I can speak you know 50 percent is in your genes and 50 percent is in the environment um so you bring you bring a lot of that genetic stuff with you and then your, your background in your childhood and the freudian stuff and so on um and then you've got your relationships and your habits and your health and your children and all that and that comes into work with you and work has very little to do with it that's one school of thought isn't it uh, I, I i don't agree with that i i, I genuinely think that uh, we spend more time at work than anywhere else. Um, all the studies seem to show that if you have a good job, you have the benefits of good work, you're mentally healthier than somebody who doesn't even need to work at all. Um, and and I, I, in my new book uh, coming out in a few months, um, I, I've done an adaptation of Reason's Cheese Model uh, and put a blank cheese in, you know, the benefits of, of good work um, can actually act as a blank. You know, so you've got everything else going on. We've all got all sorts, haven't we? But, but if you've got a really good job that gives meaning to your life, and you're talking about Victor Frankl and, you know, man's search for meaning and so on, um, then that can make all the difference in the world. And, and I think a couple of examples of that in practice, um, you know, as an academic thing, but as a real thing, things like ex-cricketers, you know, obviously cricket a big sport in Australia. Well, well it used to be anyway, you know. 
Yeah, until a, a controversy that happened, which we won't talk about. Yeah, yeah. Just, just yeah. you lost the game. Uh, hey, hey, I said we don't <laughs> talk about that. Uh, okay, and, and anyway, uh, jo- jokes about cricket aside, you know, so things like ex cricketers or ex soldiers. So you, what, what you get is you don't have a big suicide problem in the world of professional cricketers or, or, the, or in the army for that matter, you know, because they self select there really early, as we've already discussed. But what you do get is a big problem after they've left. You know, so it's ex-cricketers and ex-soldiers who, who've lost that camaraderie in the change room. I suppose a lot of cricket in my day, you know, and, and, and it's wonderful, isn't it? The best bit is in the change room when you've got new spikes and everybody stamps on your feet and all the rest of it and jokes and, and abuse and, and so on. And that, and that camaraderie uh, as they go through, especially if you're professional and you're doing it all the time, um, you know, they, they, they really miss it. So uh, I, I think actually, no. Good, good work is good for you, and we spend half our waking lives in work. Clearly, it's got to have an impact on our mental health. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. So what's your view then of the relationship between behavioural safety and psych health and safety? Um, well, it, it, it depends. If you step back and, and look at the overall workplace, they're just two subsets of the same pod, aren't they? You know? So, um, so, so for example, uh, I, I come up with this thing called a blue pie model. Um, I'll, I'll send you the, the link to the article on SHP online if you're interested, or any of your readers are interested. And what it basically says is the reasons golden rules of human error. You know, um, a, a, a small sliver of your, of your day, you're going to be away with the fairies. You're going to need another coffee. <laughs> yeah, you know, because we can only really concentrate for an average of about 55 minutes an hour. And that's if we're having a good day. You know, we've slept well, we've got no relationship issues, we've got no money issues, we've got no health issues, we're not on medication, we like our job, we get on great with our supervisors and our peers, you know, we've got the resources we need so we're not stressed about time and so on. You know, we're just doing a job like, like we're doing right now, you know. Um, but you're still going to spend five minutes an hour away with the fairies because we've got uh, a limited capacity for that. Um, and, and so it's all about anticipating that, you know, and designing it out. So, so a really simple example from behavioural safety. Don't, don't say to people, never take your eye off the floor, always look where you're walking, pay full attention at all times. You, you, you could say that. Um, but we know that if you've got 10,000 workforce around the world and they're, and they're missing five minutes every hour, that's an awful lot of vulnerable time to trip over things. Mm. So a better strategy, a proactive strategy is to say, look, in the 55 minutes when you're bright and alert, if you see a trip hazard, stop, tidy it up, and then it's not there to trip over 20 minutes from there when you come back around the corner away with the fairies yeah? and, uh, and so on. In, in terms of psychological health, how it interacts is I think some of us are having bad days. You know, the blue pie is a big blue pie. You know, it's like 20 minutes of your... Of your of your of your full circle, um, and one of the causes of that uh, human fallibility, as we've said, uh, then you've got things like not enjoying your job, hating your boss because they got the emotional intelligence of a <laughs> of somebody with not really much emotional intelligence, <laughs> <laughs> um, or you're tired, or you're on medication, or you've been self medicating and you're just trying to get through the day on stodgy sandwiches because you're soaking up last night's alcohol, or of course. Uh, you're struggling you know that you're the one in four one in five who's struggling um and your day is full of depressive thoughts you know regrets about past events or anxious thoughts anxieties and fears about future events you know or something much more severe than that well you know 85 percent is depression anxiety isn't it so you know if you if you're having a bad day you're distracted um and, and that just bleeds straight into the whole more likely to have an accident thing yeah, it's, it's interesting how you talk about that. Um, you know, I've got a fair bit of experience uh, in fatigue risk management, right? And I remember back in the day, you know, going back to the mid 2000s and it was kind of uh, new talking about working hours and, and fatigue. And there'd be a lot of supervisors I'd speak to and go, no, that's the individual's problem. They've been up all night, you know, playing computer games or, you know, they haven't slept well, that's their fault. And now they're bringing that into work. We expect them still to have 55 minutes out of every hour where they've got full attention. Uh, and that's just not logical to expect that. Um, I think we've gotten to a point where for many, they're willing to put up their hand if they're fatigued, if they're in a high risk role. Um, we've destigmatized that. Uh, but I don't think we've gotten to the point yet where people are willing to put up their hand and say, look, I'm only 40 out of 60 today um, because of all these, these issues going on at home. 
Yeah, no, and and you know, a lot of organisations can be really quite simplistic about it. I did a job for a big um, transport company in the UK. I did some work with the board years ago, and they said, "Look, we have a real problem just after shift change. You know, after people come off or go on to nights." And uh, they, they, you know, we think they're doing foreigners. That's what the problem is. And they keep having accidents and so on. So I, I looked into it. I, I, hang on a minute. You're not, you're not giving them enough time to adjust. You know, we can only do it an hour a day. Even if you're a professional rugby team and you know all the tricks about, you know, eating, exercising, taking the right, you know, whatever. Um, you could, it's an hour and a half a day. So if, if you want to shift 12 hours, it's going to take you two weeks you know, before you're fully physiologically up to speed. And they said, well, we've looked at the European directives and we're, we're compliant. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. well, that's all right. Because the European directives have got a hotline straight into God or, or you know, or the laws of physiology. And uh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and they, they, it, it took them a couple of minutes to get their heads around that, you know, but, but we followed the rules, you know. And, and of course, what, as you always, I mean, the classic thing we were working with any organization on their culture is a lot of organizations have just got in their DNA. If we follow the rules, if we're compliant, if we're not in trouble, if we pass our audits, if we've got the certificates on the wall, we're fine. Yeah. You know, and, and they can't quite get their head around the fact that the world doesn't work that way. You know, yeah. we structured it that way to try and try and, you know, generate all sorts of uh fees for certificates and, and assurance and so on. But uh, yeah, no, my favorite was where um, the working hours um, codes of practice and whatnot would suggest up to 14 days straight of 12 hour shifts was like the maximum people could do like the maximum risk threshold, basically um, you shouldn't do any more than that. So companies thought, all right, it will work 14, 12 hour days straight. <laughs> <You know? So. laughs> that's what we're allowed. <laughs> that's what we're allowed. That's the maximum yeah. we're allowed. So we'll work that. We'll that's, that's good roster design. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to go. I'm going to go out there with a wild prediction. I think they probably had quite a little bit of human error to deal with and, and, and mismanage. <laughs> you know, just as a guess. Yeah, no, I don't think you're far wrong. So, talking about BBS, um, do you think psych health and safety can be integrated into BBS processes? Um, well, yes. You know, um, I mean, either proactively, uh, uh, proactively, of course. If if you've got 25% of your workforce, as I say, you know, 20. 15, it doesn't mean we argue about definitions, but say if one in five is having a big blue pie, you know, anything you can do to have that, you know, obviously the classic step change, you, you know, so so 30% of your workforce are spending 25% of their day really pretty zoned out. You know, if you can have that, that is a significant improvement in, in your risk management, isn't it? Mm. So so you, you, you really you really want to be, looking at that because that will be the root cause you know and and people say well there's no relationship between mental health and accidents well of course there is you know it's, it's impossible to untangle because you've got confidentiality issues and issues of medication and issues of self-medication and, and actually unpicking what's causing what is is almost impossible uh, for, for those reasons but but three things seem to come through when you when you look at look at the research uh, that the first one is that people are struggling with mental health are more easily distracted, less situational awareness, less aware of the risk because they're thinking of something else. Second one is they can be quite fatalistic. You know, if you're, if you're in a really depressive mood, it's really difficult to care too much. And so you care less about the risk. You know, it's more whatever, you know. And the third thing, of course, is if you're struggling, you can get quite angry um, and, and, uh, and manifest uh, attitudes and behaviours that are really not helpful, can actually create risk. Certainly, you know, um, by, by being angry, miscommunicating or, or walking past, you know, walking past something you should do and, and not intervening because you're so you, you can actually help create risk. And I think for, for yourself and others, uh, I think for those three reasons, self-evidently, if you're having a really bad day at work, you're going to be causing more accidents. Not necessarily, of course, but overall in, in, in percentage terms. Uh, yeah. so, so what do organizations do? Well, they, they, they need to see getting as many people having a small blue pie as possible uh, as a key strategic aim in terms of their risk management. Because, you know, we, we, we fall over things, we break things, we're clumsy with people and we're rude and they get really upset and, you know, and all that kind of ripples and virtuous and vicious circles. But, but you know, the, the, the other thing they do is they, they make mistakes that cost us money. You know, they press the wrong button and they switch off Heathrow, one of my clients. Um, 
or they, uh, you know, which makes the news, <laughs> or, or they, they, they send the wrong batch to the wrong place, or they, they forget to check a gauge, or it's etc. 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 You know, they make all sorts of very expensive mistakes, you know. Yeah. Uh, I liked um, how you talked before about your approach to BBS, which looks more at the root cause and, and the systems. Um, and, uh, you know, really the workplace doesn't need to understand all the individual contributors to someone not feeling great or not having full control of their pie, as you call it. Um, but they need to look at the things that are within their control, which is the design of work, right? Right. And, and well, you know, and, and this is the obvious point, the point that some work that was done decades ago at Sheffield University, uh, Professor Peter War, uh, hugely important piece of work called his vitamin model uh, of mental health and, and, and workplace factors. Uh, nine, I, I think it is. And, and, he, and he calls it a vitamin model because he says, look, you can have too much of a good thing. You know, and he, and he walks, obviously, you need to have enough money. Um, and then having lots and lots of money, as a rule, doesn't doesn't affect you too badly, you know, except if you win the lottery, in which case you lose, you lose the plot, lose all your friends and social structure, and it's really bad for you, actually. <laughs> but uh, but the, the other factors that we're, we're talking about are things like autonomy and control, skill use, variety, and so on. Uh, and, and, you know, this whole lockdown thing is throwing that into sharp relief. You know, a lot of people like working from home. You know, a lot of people hate working from home. Um, and, and for a lot of people, they hate working from home and they love working from home on the same day, <laughs> depending, you know, whether yeah. they're supposed to be homeschooling or, or, or whatever or setting their own pace. And, and so what Wars Vitamin Model says is, look, some people, for example, the, the obvious example, they like a lot of autonomy. They like so much autonomy, really, they can't function unless they're self-employed. You know, and all, and all that. Other people are really comfortable without much autonomy. So they're, they're, you know, they, they don't mind being told what to do so much. But you put the wrong person in the wrong place, you know, and what you've got is a huge amount of stress uh, 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 and so on. Uh, you know, and then the other, the other one in, in the model is interpersonal contact. Some people like a lot of interpersonal contact, very gregarious, very sociable. Other people are quite solitary. You know, and again, that's I don't mind working from home on my own. A quick five minute Zoom with a friend, that'll do me, you know. Um, uh, but and again, that changes depending on your mood. But what the one thing we all desperately want is good quality <laughs> interpersonal contact. And none of us want lots of bad quality interpersonal contact. So if you're if you are, uh, for example, a quite solitary, uh, introverted individual, um, and you are put in a situation where you get lots of bad quality interpersonal con contact, obviously you've got a major stressor. Yeah. It's inconceivable you're going to have a nice looking group pie. Yeah. So it's um yeah, all, all about finding the right person for the right uh work environment, um, or adjusting the work environment to suit the people that you've got. Well, well, well absolutely. And the whole thing about home working and work life balance is is, you know, we, we know what best practice is, which is to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what works what it was your safety differently again i mean what what works for you what would work for you how can i help you what you know what's going to make tomorrow be a good day for you it's yeah. not it's not rocket science is it now we've mentioned it though and we've had to mention it a few times on this podcast previously where um you know people often like to do these surveys and they'll push them out and go oh we now know the problem because you know we've got these people have answered the survey like, but have you really spoken to people and really understood why workload's high? You can't just throw money at it or people at it. Like, you know, is there inefficiencies in what they're doing or is there something that they're not being given to be able to do their job productively? Um, and so, yeah, we always say, you know, if you're going to overspend in any part of the process around risk management to psych hazards, do it in the consultation phase, <laughs> really understand the problem, talk to people. You know, yeah, I, I mean, a, cl a classic example, we use, you know, the, the famous saying, you can have it quick, you can have it cheap, you can have it good quality. Pick yeah. any two, <laughs> you know, and, and, and what I do as, as a manager is I just cascade that to you. Okay, over to you two. Um, and if you could just take care of that for me, just don't get it wrong. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell you what wrong looks like, by the way, just, you know, <laughs> uh, well, that, that's colossally stressful. And, and you know, you, you're bound to be. Um, you're bound to struggle. And the other one, of course, is giving people mixed messages. And, and again, the classic one from the world of safety culture is, um, I, I, would you please do this job by Friday? You know, uh, by, would you please do this job safely, but by Friday? Yeah. And we all know, just like if I say, you know, I, I really enjoyed this podcast, but you know that something negative is bound, you know, is, is, is coming. Um, 
you know, and so so what you get, of course, is you get the job done by Friday uh, as safely as is viable. Um, but then if something goes wrong, I, well, I, I told you safely. I absolutely explicitly mentioned safety, did I not? And you got it wrong. So, you know, and, and then and we were all in court and the supervisor saying, well, I said safely. And the person who's pressed the wrong button was they were rushing says, well, you know, I, I thought that's what they wanted me to do, you know, but I'm not sure why I thought that, but I kind of knew and, uh, you know, and it all gets very messy and blamey. You know, so. yeah. yeah, the the good old double bind. <laughs> yeah. Always yeah. works in management's favour and um, never in the, the favour of the the poor person who happened to be on the end of the mistake at the time. Well, well absolutely. And you, and you get that, of course, in uh, in contracting. Yeah. You know, I, I have now delegated my problem to you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. And when you get, um, yeah, for example, drilling contracts that are, you know, based on um, volume drilled, um, you, yeah. Speed, speed over everything else, really. Well, I, my, my very first behavioural safety job was with a company called Chep UK. I don't know if they're in Australia. They might be. The Blue Pallets? Yep. Yep. Chep Blue Pallets. I, I, no, I, I used thought, to work at Woolworths. We saw a lot of those no. Blue Pallets. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the old days, of course, you know, I, I, I do mean the last century, literally. Um, you know, what they would do is you'd, you'd, you'd repair them. They'd come in broken and, and you'd repair them and you were paid for how many you repaired. So you've got, you know, handheld air-powered saws, air-powered nail guns, um, forklift trucks hammering back and forth, and a production line literally put it on, fix it, boom, 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 push it on, off, and another one. And they were they were paid for for the speed of work. Yeah, so, and it's a pretty, it's a, it, I, I might I, I might be misremembering this, but I'm pretty certain that I was told that it was such a tough job that if you walked off it, if you gave it a week and said, I can't do this, and you walked off it, you could still keep your doll, uh, your, your, your security payments, because they thought, well, thank you for trying. You know, normally you're not allowed to walk away from a job, you know, but it, it was that tough. And uh, and obviously we had to get our, our, our head around the quota system. Uh, otherwise we were going nowhere, you know. Yeah, well, that's it. It's um, ultimately what you um, what you compensate people for is what they're going to pay the most attention to, isn't it? Well, yeah, we've got to eat. Mm. Um, so we've, on this podcast, um, on a couple of episodes, we've sort of touched on the idea of psychological distress as a performance shaping factor in sort of an overall error and accident causation um, type of a model. Um, can you talk a little bit to that idea? I, th- I thought I already had, didn't we I? Did, we did a little bit, yeah. Um, is there anything, yeah, you did talk um, about it already. No, not 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 really. I, I I think I think that's it, isn't it? You know, if you are struggling, you you are more easily distracted. Uh, you have less situational awareness and focus. You're more likely to be fatalistic, and you are more likely to to actually do or not do things that that create risk uh, around you. You know, so you contribute to it. I don't think it's any more more complicated than that. I mean, obviously, it's infinitely complicated because that 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 last point. You, you fail to do things that would help. So for example, you're a supervisor and you've got to give a toolbox talk on, on, a, on a safety critical task that, that's coming up. Maybe you're on an oil rig and there's a delivery coming and there's docking and cranes and, you know, or, or, or whatever, you know. Um, if you do it badly, <laughs> if, if you do it badly, um, all sorts of terrible things can happen to yourself and, and, and people around you. You know, um, and, you know, and uh, the, of the classic one, of course, is there's somebody who's doing something that's clearly unsafe. You really should stop and challenge it um, or, or ask them if they need any help. And you don't. You just think, oh, well, whatever, you know, what will be, will be. And, 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 you, and you walk past. So it's infinitely complex, but I think really very simple. Mm. Um, I can think of some examples that I've seen. Um, one in particular comes to mind um, where the... Um, the crew on this particular facility were employed on a monthly hitch. Um, so they only had a job basically for a month at a time and then they go home for a month and then they'd find out literally three or four days before they were due to go back again, whether or not they had um, another month's work. Um, so, you know, can't get a loan, can't buy a house, can't even, buy, you know, get a loan for a car or anything like that. It's hard to get a, a rental lease um, all of that sort of thing. Um, and this this particular um, employer, the contract that they had with their client was for a, about 18 months. Um, so, you know, they knew that they had the work for 18 months, but they were 
only going to give their crew work for, for a month at a time. Um, and then they found that, yeah, they started having accidents. Things started going wrong. Crew members weren't speaking up when they saw that there was something that wasn't actually being done properly and they could see that it wasn't going to go right, but they didn't want to speak up because they didn't want to be the, um, you know, not required back person in that situation. Yeah, no, you see that a lot, especially in the offshore, of course. And uh, I mean, you know, in, in the old days, you, you'd see people who would get up at three in the morning, drive through the night, be at Bristol's heliport in Aberdeen and be at the front of the queue to hand in their documents and get on the helicopter and be told, nah, we don't need you as Go, cool. You know, and I, I remember being on a platform and I actually had a job uh, that, I, that I was given was to try and debrief. Uh, a, a chap and what had happened is he'd, he'd had an accident his contractor had an accident and he'd been given a final warning you know you know the classic blame blame culture I, I can't remember if it was the platform that like they got the, the famous quote we have no name no blame on this platform it's just that management love to know who it is they're not blaming <laughs> and uh I, I don't know if it was the same platform but anyway they he'd had an accident and they'd said that's your last warning any anything else like that and, and and he needed the just as you described, you know, he needed the money. Uh, I, I I I I seem to remember he, he had young children. Anyway, he got himself in a white tiz. He got really anxious, yeah, and and had another accident, you know, and um and that and he knew for a fact that that was him finished and 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 I'll be, um and he was just in the canteen crying, you know, I mean it's just it's a bloody oil rig, you know, <laughs> which. You can't have people that you put into that much psychological stress in charge of really big, dangerous, important things. It's it's not sensible. Yeah. <laughs> would you say, would you say grown adult to, to just sobbing? <laughs> yeah, I, I seem to think though that um, if it's not safety pr- practitioners, maybe it's HR practitioners um, who look at work related stress and exposure to psych hazards as something that doesn't really contribute to accidents. Right? It just leads to people, you know, feeling stressed and. Um, you know, not their usual self. Um, but what you're talking about is that direct correlation or association between someone who isn't mentally fit um, and obviously contributing to major accidents occurring potentially. Well, well, yes. Uh, you know, we, we all know that every accident lo- lo- looks like a, a, an unbelievable set of consequences. And, you know, when that one second thing, we just take that one second back and, uh, and so on. But, you know, all, all we're ever doing in, in behavioural safety and risk management generally it's just trying to work the odds, isn't it? It's just trying to find out where things are going wrong and have it and then have it again. So it was only a quarter of what it was. And even then, it's a guerrilla war. You know, I think James Reason coined the term, didn't he? It's just a guerrilla war. You know, you've got people involved. You've got time schedules involved. Something's going to go wrong sooner or later. But if you're smart, if you utilise your resources well, you, if you, you know, if you pick your moments from coming to come down from the hills and strike, you can actually fight a rearguard action that goes on almost indefinitely, you know, and, and you know, and then the Russians give up and go home from Afghanistan and so on. Um, and, and it's just a, it's just a guerrilla war, isn't it? But, you know, some people fight it an awful lot smarter than others, if you ask me, when it comes to you and Emma. And, and, and one of the, one of the smart things you do is you get HR to coordinate the safety. You know, I, I just think any, any, hard dichotomy there any any turf war over over training budgets classically and the like is just disastrous for for a grown-up integrated holistic approach to the risk management Mm. um i'm sort of wondering if um what your thoughts are on this but um you know we see businesses a lot thinking that you know focusing on mental health is kind of a, a nice to have but it's not you know, it's not sort of vital to their, or it's not viewed with the same significance as safety in in terms of their business priorities. And I wonder if we, um, as professionals in this area, focused more on the role of of psych health and safety in actual sort of safety outcomes. Um, if we might get more traction, what are your thoughts on that? Well, well, well yeah, you know, and and I, I think the thing that drives a lot of people, certainly in the UK, you know, with our risk based legislation and so on, is it's very expensive to have accidents. You know, there's a direct consequence. People, you know, nobody's ever going to, you know, we got these manslaughter laws, but they're, they're never going to be applied, you know, um, not, not, not really effectively. But, but it is genuinely inconvenient. You know, paperwork is colossal, you know, inquiries, fines, um, threats of jail, all that. And we just don't have it. We just don't have it around the mental health piece. Um, and, and that's, 
that that's the reason and so that that kind of it's easy to not do it um and fudge it and and do some mental gymnastics that rationalize it bleeds into things like mental health first aiders i, I don't mean to denigrate mental health first aiders in any way you know uh, but but some companies think look well i've done i've done the the training i've got the certificate on the wall we, we've we've got it covered you know uh there we go uh, what, what else do we need to do really um and, you know, I, I, I try, try and tell a, a story. Back in the day, um, in the late 70s, I did a day at Lamwyn Steelworks in South Wales. And uh, it was a bit of a, a rough old place in those days. You know, and I, 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 I think I drove there on my motorbike. Well, you know, in the story, my mum takes me, right, and drops me off because I'm only 16. And, and they say, no, no, Mrs. Marsh, you know, I, I know the steelworks is a scary place. There's, there's hot metal flying everywhere. There's toxic gases and noxious fumes. Um, there's forklift trucks hammering up and down. There's a horrible bullying management culture, but don't worry about it because we've got six highly skilled first aiders out there and they'll take care of Tim for you, you know, and, and I, she wouldn't have been particularly assured by that, I don't think. <laughs> and uh, and nor should she be. And I think it's the same with 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 mental health first aiders. You know, we, we've got them trained. We're trying to spot. We've got posters that say it's OK to not be OK, but we're just grinding them into the ground, mm. um, you know, and. Uh, that that is not a, ho- a holistic, objective, rational, or productive strategy, or a risk-based strategy. Oh, well, guess what I'm saying? Yes, that's yeah. It's that they they they're not they're not doing that on the basis of risk and outcome. They're doing that on the basis of uh, I- ignorance and um, and short-termism. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for people to get sick and then we'll give them some medicine. Um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, and I, well, or, or uh, just point them with the, uh, employee assistance, mm. refer them, you know, but, that, but, but for what it's worth, I know we're getting towards the end of the hour now. I, I really think it's an incredibly simple strategy that organizations need, you know, uh, um, you know, because, uh, 85% of what's going wrong in, in the mental field, uh, depression and anxiety, you know, you've got other things like sch- schizophrenia, uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, uh, hormonal issues like baby blues and so there's all sorts of stuff that's difficult but for, for 85 percent of the people out there who are struggling it's it's a flicking between anxiety and depression you know that, that classic cartoon you know of uh, spending too much time thinking about things that have already happened um, which uh, you know which is unproductive because it's already gone get back in the present or, or thinking about too too much about things that might happen you know, and again, a cognitive behavioural therapist would say every minute spent worrying about something happening that hasn't happened yet steals a minute from you working to ensure that it doesn't. So get back in the present and we've got all the mindfulness stuff, you know. Uh, and I think really there's, there's, there's only two things that organisations need to do. The first one is to try and spot that people are drifting towards critical. We all have depressive thoughts and anxious thoughts all day, every day. We all do. It's just when it gets to a critical level that it gets in the way. Um, and, you know, having organisations spot that that's the case, I think, is, is is key. Mental health first aiders can help with that. Of course they can. And um, they also set the tone. It's OK to not be OK. You know, it's good to talk uh, and so on. But you know, it doesn't need to be mental health first aiders. If you've got all your frontline supervisors, if you've got the people who run the place really switched on to all this stuff with a general, g- genuine, empathic, caring culture, that they'll ask the question, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, so I tried to plug the, the new book, but, you know, the, the old book was about talking safety and it was introduce yourself, set the tone, analyze, do some coaching and so on, boom, boom, you know, and, and, and the new book really says introduce yourself and set the tone. Yeah. Um, ask people if they're OK, but you're going to get the answer. Um, yes, I'm fine. Thank you. Of course you are. You always do. Um, so once you've done some anal- analysis and some coaching and you've built a rapport before you go, then revisit that simple question. And, and are you OK? Because now you might actually get a conversation going, you know, just stopping people and asking them is, is you just get the formal answer, don't you? Press and press and play. So, so if you can generate a culture where people do talk and disclose and be honest and open, obviously you've got to blame culture. Everybody's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's something. And the second thing is just to create an organization that keeps people in the middle, that generates the benefits of good, good work is good for you because it's, you know, it, your, your job is tailored to you best, best it can be, you know, um, your supervisor is c- caring and constructive and, and not a, a risk factor and a, and a, you know, a stressor. 
you know. Um, and, and the good news is that that culture of, of, of excellence, that culture of holding people in the middle, enjoying being a professional cricketer, enjoying being a soldier, whatever, you know, um, it, it's good for everything. You know, if, if you've got that engagement and involvement and that camaraderie and that teamwork, well, that applies to everything, doesn't it? You know, customer relations, quality, all that, and all the automatic good old fashioned behavioral safety stuff. You know, if you see somebody about to do something unsafe, step in and stop them, challenge, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All that, all that citizenship behavior, all that contribution stuff comes naturally from it, doesn't it? Mm, absolutely. Was it who was talking about um, relationship as the, um, as the measure rather than um, economics? Was it Richard? Yeah, I think it was Richard Clayton. Yeah. 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 Sort of the similar, um, similar idea there. We're yeah focusing on the um, on the quality of the the relationship that you have with your employees and the quality of work life for them um, should be the focus of the organisation rather than um, the their financial, um, yeah sales and profits. Mm. That 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 makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you get if you get that right, it's almost inconceivable that you won't make lots of money and and you won't automatically be sustainable. Mm. You know. Um, uh, but if you get it wrong, you might, of course, as lots of organisations are demonstrating, make lots of money in the short term, but you're causing huge amounts of stress. I mean, if, if it's such a strong business model, you can get away with it. Yeah. yeah well, that's, know, um, yeah. And that's where legislation comes in. That's where that's where our politicians need to earn their, their keep, frankly, because, you know, the capitalism will push it as far as it can. Of course it will, you know. Um, so our politicians and our legislators need to come in and say enough already, you know. <laughs> Um, but for, for organisations that haven't got an incredibly strong business model that is just so robust you can't break it, you know, it's all those it's all those KPIs. If, if you've got somebody who turns up, has a small blue pie day, nine days out of ten goes home, you know, they 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 got uh, they, you're not struggling with absenteeism, you're not struggling with presenteeism, you're not losing your best staff to turnover, you're getting lots of uh, discretionary effort, organisational citizenship behaviour. Yeah, all, all, all those things are, uh, are taken care of themselves and, and all those KPIs directly plug into is your business sustainable? Mm. Yeah, you know, they're not going down the pub saying, oh, you don't want to work for them, they're a bunch of whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, quite, quite the opposite and all that reputation. And these days, of course, you know, I, I, we discussed in the beginning, I'm a dinosaur, but even I know that you can't get away with anything these days because it's on social media and dedicated websites that are anonymous saying, you know, boom, boom, boom. So, yeah. Now, it sounds tremendously simple. <laughs> um, it'd be great to see more organisations adopt it. Uh, yes, but but what, what's interesting um, is that when you talk to boards, you know, we all know that a lot of very senior managers are on the autistic spectrum. They're, they're you know, they've got Asperger's. They're very, very clever, uh, savant almost, you know. Um, uh, and, and CFOs, of course, are, are notorious for that. Um but if you if you can make the business case, if you can point out that actually, uh, in the medium to long term, um, they they their sustainability risks and they'll have a risk matrix, of course, knocking around, um, are directly impacted by the stuff we're talking about, uh, and and it, it isn't even really a particularly long term investment; it's a short to medium term investment. They they will go for it, and I think I think a lot of the mental health first aiders reflect that. You know, somebody's made the business case that's struck home. So they've thought, well, we can pay for that. That doesn't seem too expensive, really. And they've paid for it and they've got the certificate. But now they're thinking about something else. And, and they haven't gone for the holistic piece. They've just hoped that there's a magic bullet. You know, in behavioural safety, how many times over the last 30 years have I seen organisations who just say, right, Tim, we're going to let we're going to let you on the platform and you get to train everybody. And, that'll, you know, half hour each, eh? And uh, that'll that'll sort it. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I think I think we're revi we're revisiting that with the mental health piece, definitely, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. There are some very um, slick, slickly marketed mental health kind of programs for workplaces who have done some sort of ROI analysis, which they can sell. Um, but a lot of these, like even here in Australia, you know, one of the most quoted uh, research articles looking at the ROI of mental health activities um, is focused on resilience training in EAP. Um, you know, but we know that we need to get more to the root cause and not just helping people deal with the symptoms. 
But well, any anybody switched on will say uh, resilience training last if at all. You know, uh, I, I agree. I, there's a, we have a woman here called Susie Orbach, uh, married to the oranges of the only fruit, just Jeanette Winterson, a famous psychi- psychotherapist. Anyway, uh, and I saw her interviewed, um, and they said, "Look, if you had a magic wand, what would you do? Would you give, would you give counselling to everybody?" And she said, no, absolutely not. I'd give emotional intelligence training to every supervisor and every, every parent. Yeah. And we, we'll, we'll nip it at source, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, same, the same sort of thing, isn't it? So. Yeah, absolutely. So we've had a, a terrific discussion about some of your um, previous experiences, um, you know, working particularly uh, in construction and, and oil and gas. Um, what would your hopes, though, be for the future, uh, particularly around psychological health and safety or workplace mental health? Oh, uh, well, what we've discussed that, um, I, you know, uh, there is no magic wand. Um, a lot of people uh, out there are, are very uh, focused on profit and, and stock markets and, and all that. That's never going to change. Um, but that, that, that as a profession, more and more, we can sell the idea that good psychological health is an integral part of good human error risk management and sustainability for their organizations and that it is joined up it is integrated and a holistic humanistic compassionate um, approach to 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 the issue um, will will benefit everybody is genuinely a win-win and and the more we can sell that idea uh, you know the um, the better, the better will be. In the UK, for example, we have world-beating safety safety standards, and we're not world-beating at anything else. So it's just really interesting. And and as a Welshman, this 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 kind of resonates with me. We had a guy. Um, uh, oh, I can't remember his name now. Bloody hell, Robins, wasn't it? Um, and he was in charge of the coal board when we had our van, which was only ten miles from me when I was a kid in a similar school. Um, and a lot of children crushed when they, when the, the slurry came down the mountain and so on. And his guilt from that, gener- they, they say that his guilt from that actually fed into him writing a really good report about safety um, from which the risk-based approach comes from, you know, um, as the Robins report, which begat the Health and Safety at Work Act, 74, I think. Um, uh, and and, and that's, that, that's what we need. We need somebody to grab I mean, without hopefully going through what Robins went through, but to grasp that this is actually good stuff and come up with some legislation. It all starts from the very top, doesn't it? Um, that, that builds a framework that makes it very easy for organizations to get on board with this sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, that uh, applicability and uh, practical implementation, I think is so important. There's um, a lot of really great standards out there from the likes of Canada and whatnot. But, um, you know, they actually even need a, their own guide to go with the standard in order to, you know, interpret it and how do I apply this? So. Yeah. And, and you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, you know. So, mm. you know, just, just organisations print these things off and they put them on their walls and they say, that's us, that is. That's what we do. That's what we believe in. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Except not at all, really. <laughs> It's just a poster on a wall. And, and if you go and do any sort of conversation in the smoke shack, in, in the canteen, um, we, as you know, we're back to, yeah, we have no name, no blame. It's just that management love to know who it is they're not blaming and and, and all that stuff. And, and again, safety differently. You know, they, they come up with some fantastic phrases that stick. They say, I used it in a court case uh, not so long ago, actually. Their safety is said, and then their safety is actually done. Uh, and, and I think we're finding that with a mental health. There's a mental health strategy is said, and then there's what we actually do to our workers when we've got them for eight hours a day or, or 12 in, in, in the case of your, your guys. Yeah. All right. Um, for the professionals who might be listening and have an interest in, in moving into this area of uh, psych health and safety, do you have some words of advice for them? Yes, do it. It's fascinating. Uh, I, I, I've personally been working in this field for a quarter of a century or more, more, um, and uh, I still love it. You know, it's 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 a hugely rewarding, hugely interesting, and if you get it right, um, hugely effective way of, of contributing. And we all need to, to we all need an excuse to get out of bed and uh, or brush our hair if <laughs> we need a big brush <laughs> today. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, uh, if, 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 I, I, if I'm being viewed, the reason I have this hat on is not because I'm trying to be down with the kids. It's because I haven't had a haircut for four months and my hair grows quite quickly and I look like a scarecrow underneath. Um, so I thought seeing me look a little pretentious with a hat on, but then getting over it was better than making me just spend the entire interview thinking I look like Wurzel Gummidge uh, and a totally mad <laughs> professor. Yeah. I'd rather look like a slightly pretentious professor than a completely barking professor, you know, so. Yeah. Now, you have spoken a fair bit today about, you know, um, that good work is good for you. And, um, yeah, psych health and safety, it's, it's very meaningful work. You're having a terrific benefit for, you know, the employees who are out there. And, obviously, the employers can get a lot of benefit, as you've talked about today as well. Well, it's like Australia, isn't it? I, I'm making the link. You know, an awful lot of people want to emigrate to Australia. Some do. Hardly anybody comes home. So same with psychology. A lot of people on my travel say, I wish I'd studied psychology. Hardly find anybody ever who says, I wish I hadn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go. Well, uh, Tim, it's been a fantastic conversation with you today. Um, one of my favorite chats, I think, so far. And we've done a couple of dozen already in the last couple of months. So um, thank you so much for coming on board. Um, for those who are listening, if you'd like to see Tim's uh, beanie that he's talking about today, he might even take his uh, beanie off for in a second to show you what his hair looks like. <laughs> hey, there hey. You go. <laughs> now you have to check out the video. Wow, that's... <laughs> he does look like a scary professor. Um, make sure you check out the YouTube video. Now, there you go. There's an Easter egg that you'll only see if you check out the YouTube video on, on the Flourish DX channel. Um, if you'd like to catch the, uh, the short little uh, nuggets of gold, and there's quite a few today, uh, we will put them on the Flourish DX LinkedIn channel. And uh, don't forget, you can check uh, check in with uh, Joelle and myself on LinkedIn. Uh, Tim's also on LinkedIn. Um, so feel free to follow us or connect with us to continue the conversation online. So thanks again to the listeners and we'll catch you next episode.